The dream to own a home just got a little more real this week as more people will be able to qualify with newer, more lenient thresholds. His whole attitude is basically, I didn't think it was important. And it really does beg the question, what the hell's going on at this agency? Questions over a blocked doorway at a busy commuter center in San Ysidro, the key piece of communication that could shed light on the case. I assume this is about what went on at the motel. What happened at the motel? And a look at this weekend's offerings in the theaters, including Catherine Bigelow's exploration of the riots that rocked Detroit in 1967. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Board members of the San Diego Association of Governments got a presentation today from a law firm hired to investigate the agency. The investigation covered SANDAG's botched revenue forecasting for last year's tax measure and the agency's response to that scandal being made public. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen was at the board meeting and has more. It was a long and sometimes awkward meeting of the SANDAG board today. The main question, who should be held accountable for all of the mistakes this agency has made? Board members listened intently as the investigation's author presented his findings. He was hired to look at how SANDAG overestimated by billions of dollars how much its sales tax proposal last year would have raised. That tax measure failed at the ballot box. But perhaps even worse than the forecasting errors was Sandag's response to them when they were made public by Voice of San Diego. Sandag staffers were told to start deleting draft documents and to store new ones on an isolated server that was shielded from public records requests. Investigator John Houston said that was a huge mistake. It raises way too many red flags. And ultimately, it created this appearance of a cover-up when, in fact, at bottom, at the very root of all the issues here, there was an inadvertent copy-paste error that caused issues in forecasting models over time. Dozens of members of the public showed up to chastise Sandag. Some called for the resignation of the agency's executive director, Gary Gallegos. Board members were slightly more restrained. Does anything that occurred internally rise to a level of, of a criminal investigation? I don't know that. I don't think any of us do, and that's why I think we need a deeper dive on this to really make sure we do a thorough house cleaning. The three members of the SANDAG board will continue meeting as a subcommittee to come up with a more detailed plan of action in response to this investigation. Now, whether any heads will roll as a result of that is far from certain. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. And we have an update for you on a story we brought you last fall out of San Ysidro. It's about the Metropolitan Transit Agency's legal dispute over a doorway at a commuter station. KPBS now has a letter that could be key to the case. Here's KPBS investigative reporter Amita Sharma with what you need to know. Last summer, MTS blocked the back doorway of a heavily used commuter center known as the McDonald's Trolley Station in San Ysidro. The move has inconvenienced scores of travelers, including people who are disabled. They use the doorway daily to travel between the bus terminal behind the building to the trolley station in front after crossing the border from Mexico. The closure was part of a lawsuit MTS filed against the building owner, Grand Central West, alleging the doorway was trespassing its property. Grand Central West countersued, accusing MTS of trying to choke off businesses in the building in order to give an advantage to the transit agency's contractor, SYPS. And Grand Central West also alleged that MTS violated state law by not putting the contract out to bid before it was awarded to SYPS. A letter obtained by KPBS shows that MTS's own board members, San Diego City Councilman David Alvarez, also thought the contract should be bid on. But MTS's CEO, Paul Jablonski, never told the rest of the board about that letter, according to a deposition. MTS and Jablonski declined comment, so did board member Alvarez. Grand Central West consultant Steve Padilla says the lack of disclosure raises questions. The CEO never goes to his executive committee and says, we have a concern raised by one of our board members. Here's the concern. Here's my response. Never did any of that. They just 
And when you look at Paul Jablonski's deposition, his whole attitude is basically, I didn't think it was important. And it really does beg the question, what the hell's going on at this agency? The case could go to trial in the fall, this as the doorway remains blocked to commuters. Amitha Sharma, KPBS News. Sheriff's deputy serving an eviction notice shot and killed a man this morning in the Park West neighborhood near Balboa Park. Police say the 48-year-old man threatened to arm himself with a handgun when the two deputies knocked on his door. They entered the apartment and shot the man. He died at the scene. The San Diego Police Department is handling the investigation. Getting approved for a home loan got a little easier this week. Mortgage giant Fannie Mae is allowing borrowers to have higher levels of debt and still qualify for a home loan. Mark Goldman is a real estate instructor at San Diego State University and a senior loan officer with C2 Financial Corporation. So the good news is, if you were close on qualifying for your dream home last month, you should try again this month. And another big change is self-employed borrowers are able to qualify for a mortgage loan with just one year of tax returns instead of two. The median price of a single-family home in San Diego in June was $620,000. Laptops and tablets have become a regular tool in San Diego schools. One of the challenges facing districts is making sure the devices actually become a part of how students learn every day. iNews source reporter Leonardo Castaneda has more on what districts are doing to achieve their technology goals. Ten years ago, student technology meant a computer lab and maybe one or two desktop computers for each classroom. But things have changed. In the majority of our schools, there's some level of mobile devices in the hands of students. We're seeing um, more and more of a shift away from computer labs um, into having those devices available to the students all the time during the school day, and in some cases 24-7 at home as well. So that's a huge shift. Conigan works with school districts starting technology programs. She says there are three steps to doing that well. First, know what you want your students to accomplish. Second, coach teachers on how to use the technology in their classes. And third, measure so you know your goals are being achieved. One of the first districts in the county to buy mobile devices was San Diego Unified. Over eight years, the district has spent $133 million purchasing some 232,000 laptops and tablets. Julie Garcia is the district's program manager for instructional technology. She says the district coaches teachers to integrate the devices into how students actually learn. It's very easy to say, okay, you know, go read this chapter in your book, and when you're done, go play that vocabulary game, right? We don't want the technology to be that extra or that add-on. Garcia says the district has surveyed teachers and collected anecdotal evidence that the program is working. Teachers say providing students with iPads, laptops, and Chromebooks has improved their behavior and made them pay more attention in class. For KPBS, I'm reporter Leonardo Castaneda with iNewsource, an independently funded nonprofit partner of KPBS. When you're looking for advice, you'll likely turn to those closest to you. That's what a nonprofit in San Diego City Heights community wants neighbors to do when it comes to their health. KPBS City Heights reporter Taryn Mento has the story. If you don't have your health, you have nothing, right? Connie LaFuente stressed the importance of wellness to Project Concern International's newest cohort of community health workers. The 40 participants completed the nonprofit's free program that trained them in chronic disease prevention. The goal is to plant knowledgeable neighbors in ethnic communities where rates of heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and stroke may be high. You know, if people don't prevent um, these serious chronic diseases, there is more uh, visits to the emergency room uh, and then complications. I want to do more in the future to help my communities. Participant Katabwe Kabwe says she was able to help family back in Zambia even before she finished the 10-week course. My father-in-law now is diabetic. He didn't know about that. I pushed him to go to, the, to see a doctor and to be checked. So now he's taking they're taking care of him now. Cowboy says she hopes to bring her expertise to her southeast San Diego community as a full-time health worker. La Fuente says that's the other goal of the program. We provide them uh, job readiness skills to be able to get and gain employment. Participant Trinidad Wilkinson says she already has her eye on a job at a new clinic coming to her Poway community. I can transfer the information and the knowledge that I have to people who are underserved 
and they have many barriers in their life, whether it's language, uh, transportation, childcare, and I know I can do that. Project Concern International will host another community health worker session this September. The organization is seeking participants from the African American, Latino, Filipino, Somali, and Vietnamese communities. Taryn Mento, KPBS News. And funding for the PCI's program comes from the California Endowment, which also supports our City Heights reporting. The push for California to secede from the rest of the union is gaining support from an unexpected place. A lawmaker in Utah is calling on his fellow legislators to endorse the Cal Exit movement. His reason? He's sick of hearing whining by the Golden State. The push for secession from the United States gained momentum after the election of President Trump, which supporters say was an indication that California no longer shares the goals or ideology of red states like Utah. The Tijuana taxi wars may be over for now, but we look at how crossing the border will get a lot crazier next month. And were refugee families in San Diego told to lie on rental applications? Join us for the KPBS Roundtable tonight at 8.30. Heat and music filled the air at the Bazaar del Mundo shop, shops in Old Town this morning. It's a preview of this weekend's Latin American festival. People shuffled through shops wearing sunglasses and shorts, and that's where they found shade as weather heated up. Hot, muggy weather has started to feel like the norm here in San Diego, and forecasters say part of the reason is due to a monsoon, a shift in a dome of high pressure over the desert that's building westward. The humid weather is similar to the trends you see in other parts of the country. We historically are able to have really nice days and evenings because of the cooler ocean temperatures. And what we've seen lately, especially this week and a couple times in July, is humidity levels or the mugginess of the air, the amount of moisture that's in the air, really at levels comparable to what they have in the East Coast or near the Gulf of Mexico. And we can show that scientifically on paper that compared to a 30-year average, it's much more humid than we're used to dealing with. And we understand that thunderstorms may linger this weekend. Regina Miller has more in tonight's forecast. Well, interior parts of Southern California is seeing some of that monsoonal moisture causing some thunderstorms to pop up again uh, in eastern locations. And then when we wind the view out, you can see a lot of this moisture has now started to drift up even as far northward as San Francisco. That's all monsoonal moisture there. Down into Los Angeles and San Diego, though, we have seen things drying out. So for tonight, we're just going to see increase in clouds. We're going to get a break from any of that monsoonal moisture, and we're going to see just a partly cloudy sky around for tonight. Mount Laguna, Borrego Springs looking mainly quiet there. Like I said, most of the action is farther to the east of these locations. And as we uh, check out your Saturday, some of the interior mountains here across central California, we could still be dealing with some of that monsoonal moisture, bringing some of those thunderstorms. But things look pretty quiet here across uh, southern California. California. The reason for that, we have some high pressure that's weakening. We have an area of low pressure off the coast, so that produces this westerly flow that is going to uh, push the moisture further into interior locations like the Four Corners. So this weekend, the threat shifts eastward. We just have some sunshine in the forecast. Borrego Springs, you'll have sunshine at 103. Mount Laguna tops out at 76 degrees. Into Oceanside, we're at 79 degrees with some sunshine in the forecast. Uh, the coastal locations, low clouds give way to sun for your Saturday. Clouds will break for sunshine on Sunday as well with a high of 80, 77 degrees on Monday. And inland spots, we're going to see the clouds breaking on Saturday at 87, 86 with low clouds breaking as well on Sunday. In the mountain zone, 76 degrees, sunny and pleasant Saturday, mostly sunny and nice on Sunday and on Monday with temperatures in the uh, mid to upper 70s there, 77 degrees. It gets to 79 on Tuesday, 81 by Wednesday. In the deserts, mostly sunny skies for Saturday at 103, mostly sunny on Sunday at 102. We start to heat things back up to around 105 for Tuesday and Wednesday. I'm Regina Miller, KPBS News. I'm Judy Woodruff. On the next news hour, our Stopping Superbug series continues. What incentives can inspire cures to antibiotic resistance? That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. 
Up and away with Virgin Galactic. These are scenes from today's test flight by the v USS VSS Unity. Today's flight over the Mojave Desert was a dry run for rocket-powered flights. Unity was carried up by another aircraft, then separated. The spaceship landed back at the spaceport 10 minutes later. The story of Virgin Galactic could inspire the creative minds behind Cinespace. This film festival celebrates original short films using footage from NASA. In tonight's SciTech Report, producer Tamika Weatherspoon introduces us to one director who earned top honors. The Houston Cinema Arts Festival holds a competition called Cinespace, in which filmmakers from across the country create original short films using footage from NASA. Last year, one of the top entries was directed by a creative mind from Space City itself. Take a look. There is no real life sci-fi better than NASA. As a kid, I loved science fiction movies stories, exploration, anything to do with robots and different planets and different worlds I was fascinated with. <laughs> to be an adult and be able to kind of still dabble in that genre and to develop these kind of what-if concept stories is a lot of fun. M1, you have exactly 10 minutes to final marker. Uh, I got into filmmaking about 10 years ago digital filmmaking really was a huge game changer. Going from film to digital made what I thought you know, years ago was going to be kind of impossible to do much more affordable. So when the Cinespace Film Festival came up, I thought this is a great opportunity to try and do something NASA related. The whole cool thing about this was being able to incorporate this great history of NASA and all this archival imagery they have, whether it's photography or video, into a project and develop a story. It's like being a kid, you know, you get to play with, you get to play like you're in, in space, you know, if we can't go up there, at least it's the next best thing. It's a 12 minute film. The process for the entire project was five months. And so what we did is we started initially with, you know, research and developing a storyline. Today would have been my mother's 50th birthday. So I wanted to create a film that had a international flair to it, an international feel. Uju Yudizium, the actress that plays Anuli in our film. And she is from Nigeria. So I immediately got that connection going. And then we knew that we wanted to do something based on water, water's life. And it was a really nice continuing theme throughout. Even out here so far from Earth, I still carry a piece of home with me. But the post-production was what took a long time. It was about three months of just post-production work. Everything that's happened in my life has led to this moment. Because we're taking this NASA imagery and integrating it into the story. And one of the things we had a challenge was finding 4K resolution footage to use. And we couldn't find a lot of that, so we used a lot of photography. And there are about 50 shots in the film that are visual effect shots based on some type of NASA imagery. Um, about 30 of those shots are based on photography and 20 are based on video footage. We took space station imagery and then just built our own International Space Station Mars off of that because we figured it would not be the same space station necessarily. The non-linear editing software is, is just tremendous for doing these films. It's a great way to create big scale looking films for very little money. I didn't think there would be a whole lot of music in this initially, but for this, it was that element that really tied it together. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. There is that sense of wonder and excitement that comes with space exploration. The discovery of water on Mars, that was in our film before that was ever announced, which is kind of neat. And the exploration of Mars by mankind has just been announced this September. I mean, so much research, so much stuff that went into the story. It enlightened me more and got me more excited about NASA again. 
And you can find more stories like this one on SciTech Now Sunday nights at 5.30 right here on KPBS. From chamber music to pop stars, KPBS Arts Calendar editor Nina Guerin has a preview of what's going on in San Diego this weekend. Hello and happy Friday. If it's August in San Diego, that means it's time for Summerfest, a chamber music festival put on by the La Jolla Music Society. Every summer, some of the world's best classical musicians come to La Jolla for a month of exciting concerts, workshops, and lectures. This year brings Regina Carter, Finnish musician Ali Mastonen, and many more. Also happening at Summerfest will be the first ever performance of the complete Beethoven Violin Piano Sonatas, happening over four nights. The San Diego Museum of Art has a summer tradition of its own, Screen on the Green. Every Thursday, an art-themed film is screened outdoors on the Grand Botanical Lawn just east of the museum. This year's selections include Audrey Hepburn's museum caper, How to Steal a Million, and Woody Allen's dreamy Midnight in Paris. Spots for the lawn fill up fast, so bring a picnic and get there early. When your legs don't work like they used to before. Love him or hate him, Ed Sheeran will be in San Diego this weekend. The young British folk singer is known for beautiful songs like Thinking Out Loud and for being part of Taylor Swift's crew. Even though he's a major pop star, Ed Sheeran performs without a band, just letting his acoustic guitar and his voice do all the work. Fellow English singer-songwriter James Blunt will open the show. Finally, San Diego welcomes the return of a singer who needs no introduction, Neil Diamond. The crooner is finishing up his 50th anniversary tour. Expect a two-hour concert filled with his hits like Sweet Caroline, Cherry Cherry, Love on the Rocks, and many more. Neil Diamond turned 76 this year and is considered one of America's most favorite pop institutions. That's all for this weekend. For KPBS Arts, I'm Nina Guerin. And you can stay up to date on the San Diego art scene with the KPBS Arts Calendar and our arts newsletter. Sign up at kpbs.org slash newsletter. Catherine Bigelow's new film, Detroit, leads the film openings this week, but KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando says that's not the only option you have this weekend. Here in Detroit, a city of war. On the city's west side, a 150-block area is off limits to everybody. Catherine Bigelow's new film, Detroit, looks to the tragic events of the Algiers Motel that took place during the violent unrest that rocked the Motor City in the summer of 1967. Her film looks to the killing of three black teenage boys by white police officers. The film may be light on context and insight, but it's effective in placing the audience on the ground in the tense, grueling events leading up to the killings. Her film may be flawed, but she deserves credit for not providing any comfort at the end. No one can leave pretending everything's okay. There's much that she leaves out about the bigger picture, but she succeeds in bringing the horrors of this particular tragedy to light and in making mainstream audiences consider the harsh reality of how little some things have changed in 50 years. Her hope is that the film can agitate for change and begin a discussion about race in America. Horror of a very different kind can be found in the Australian film, The Killing Ground. Australian horror has a tradition of making the outdoors scary, be it from nature or from human threats. Damien Power's film doesn't do anything innovative with the formula of campers being terrorized, but it does everything with an assured hand and a sense of craft so that it ratchets up the tension at every turn. The Killing Ground doesn't venture off into any new territory, but it's smart and solid horror filmmaking. But groundbreaking and original are words you can use to describe The Ornithologist, a film that played earlier this year at the San Diego Latino Film Festival and is returning for an engagement at the Digital Gym Cinema. The film begins simply enough with Fernando, the ornithologist of the title, heading off into the Portuguese wilderness to look for birds. Then his kayak overturns and he's rescued by some Chinese backpackers on a pilgrimage. That's just the beginning of this surreal allegory about St. Anthony of Padua, the patron saint of lost things. Go into this film with an open mind and let its stunning visuals wash over you. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. And tonight, we leave you with an NPR Tiny Desk concert by Fragile Rock. Thank you for joining us and have a great evening.